Good afternoon. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of the sponsors who are listed in your program, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this ceremony at which we bestow the 2012 Penn Hemingway and the Lawrence L. and Thomas Winship Penn New England Awards. I stumbled upon an anecdote recently about Edith Grossman, a noted translator of Spanish literature, who the author Gabriel Garcia Marquez calls my voice in English. Knowing that Marquez's favorite American author was William Faulkner, Edith Grossman translated Marquez's novel Love in the Time of Cholera with Faulkner's style as her guide. I didn't use any contractions in the narration, and I used Latinate words, polysyllabic words, instead of German monosyllables, she reported. Anytime I could, I chose a longer word rather than a shorter word, <laughs> as if Hemingway had never lived. <laughs> the story reminds me of the opening to Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, in which Kundera describes a propagandist photo he and his Czech classmates studied as children of Clement Gottwald, addressing an assembly from the balcony of the Baroque Palace in Prague as the communists swept into power. It was February 1948, snowy and cold, and Gottwald was bareheaded. Before the photo was snapped, one of his deputies, Vladimir Clementis, who was standing at his side, gallantly took off his fur hat and set it on Gottwald's head. Four years later, however, Clementis was charged with treason and hanged. In an attempt to wipe out his place in history, the propaganda section immediately made him vanish in all state-sponsored photographs, leaving Gottwald standing alone on the palace balcony. Nothing remains of Vladimir Clementis but the fur hat on Gottwald's head. There are some things in life that simply cannot be erased, and the revolutionary effect that Ernest Hemingway had on world literature is one that will long endure. As we gather each spring to bestow the annual Penn Hemingway Award, the nation's best known prize for a distinguished first book of fiction, I think of Hemingway bursting onto the literary scene in the fall of 1925, having just finished the manuscript for his first novel, The Sun Also Rises, and reading the reviews of his first collection of short stories in our time. He looks out upon the world without prejudice or preconception, wrote the New York Times reviewer, and records with precision and an economy and an almost terrifying immediacy exactly what he sees. His stories, sketches, and epigrams are triumphs of sheer objectivity. While Hemingway cannot be airbrushed from history, it's important that we continue to educate new generations about him and his works. Just this week, a young reporter was speaking with us about some new Hemingway letters that we were opening for the first time. They're actually on display um, outside this hall if you want to see them after. And the reporter said, okay, I think I understand everything about this story, she concluded. I just have one last question. Who is Papa? <laughs> In the novel we are honoring today, Teju Cole's narrator notes the similarity of two female friends comparing them to an echo that was, quote, like John the Baptist, Baptist's echo of Elijah, two individuals separated in time and vibrating on a singular frequency. It is an apt metaphor for the Penn Hemingway Award, which connects individuals as diverse as Marilyn Robinson, Jhumpa Lahari, Edward P. Jones, Ha Jin, and Ernest Hemingway, writers separated in time, yet crafting works of fiction on a singular frequency. Let me pause here and thank all those who make this annual award ceremony possible. The Hemingway Foundation and Society, which funds the Penn Award, thanks also to the UCross Foundation, the University of Idaho, and especially to Penn New England, including Helen Atwan, Richard Hoffman, and Karen Wolf, who we proudly collaborate with on this award and other efforts to help promote arts and literature in this community and beyond. We're honored to have members of the Hemingway and Winship families here with us. Carol and Patrick Hemingway are dear friends and the guiding force for the Hemingway Collection. We remain indebted to them for their generosity and the care and direction they offer to support our work. We're also joined by Sean Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway's grandson, who is the co-chair of our Hemingway Council, which raises funds and awareness for the collection. And with us today from the Winship family are Joanna Crawford, 
daughter of Lawrence L. Winship and brother to Tom Winship, both legendary editors of the Boston Globe, and her son John, who will help us bestow these prestigious awards. A few years ago, we began a tradition of asking Patrick to read an excerpt of his father's work to officially begin our proceedings. I thought by way of introducing him today, I might read a brief excerpt from an introduction he wrote to a volume of Hemingway's stories in which he describes time spent with his brothers and father in Cuba. In some summers, a hurricane or two would cut swaths through the shack houses of the poor on the island. Hurricane victims, damnificados del cyclone, would then add a new tension to local politics already taut enough under the strain of insufficient municipal water supplies, perceived outrages to national honor, like the luridly reported urination on the monument to Jose Marti by drunken American servicemen, and always the price of sugar. Lightning must still strike the house many times each summer, and when we were children there, no one would use the telephone during a thunderstorm after the time Papa was hurled to the floor in the middle of a call, himself and the whole room glowing in the blue light of St. Elmo's fire. The reference to Jose Marti, known as the Apostle of Cuban Independence, allows me to briefly acknowledge the other man we honor at this library, President Kennedy, who invoked Marti's name when speaking in 1963 in Miami to the Cuban Brigade, recently released from prison by Fidel Castro after having battled with his forces years earlier during the Bay of Pigs invasion. Only JFK could preface a stirring quote from Marti by stating, and as Marty said. <laughs> as his son, Patrick connects us with Ernest Hemingway as no one else can. Through his delightful stories about their time together, one can almost feel the fresh air of the brisa, or Cuban trade winds blowing through their home. Patrick's knowledge of his father's life and work is unparalleled, and we turn to and rely on his counsel and enduring presence like a favorite fur hat that keeps us warm on a cold day. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Hemingway. I have to admit, Tom's a good guy. <laughs> he, he really is. And uh, on behalf of my father, who isn't present today, I, I thank him with all my heart. Uh, the, the winner of this year's Hemingway Award, uh, the protagonist of his novel is a, is a, a clinical psychiatrist. And I thought, what can I pick to read from Hemingway that somehow would fit in with clinical psychiatry? <laughs> and at the end of, of um, Death in the Afternoon, there's just a, a passage that with the title is Some Reactions of a Few Individuals to the Integral Spanish Bullfight. Ages given are those at which they first saw fights. And I think the way this is written, it's a bit like a psychiatrist's notes uh, after a, an interview with a, a patient. And, and the first one begins, PH, this is the patient. Four years old, American, male. Taken by his nurse to a Spanish bullfight at Bordeaux without his parents' knowledge or permission, he called out on first seeing the bull charge the picadors, Il faut pas faire tomber le aussi. Short time later, he called out, Assis, Assis, je ne peux voir le taureau. Asked by his parents his impression of the bullfight, he said, J'aime ça. Taken to a Spanish bullfight at Bayonne three months later, he seemed very interested but did not comment during the fight. After he said, Quand j'étais jeune, La course de Toro n'était pas comme ça. <laughs> now, PH stands for me. <laughs> and uh, I, I just, I never really realized that this existed till the other day. <laughs> and although I'm portrayed as speaking French as my first language, I have always had difficulties and almost flunked it in high school. So, 
The second one is J.H., which is my older brother, Jack, nine years old, American, male, education, French lycee, one year kindergarten in U.S., ridden horses two years, allowed to go to bullfights with his father as a reward for work in school, and because his younger brother, having without parents' intention seen one with no bad results, he felt it unjust that the smaller child should have seen spectacle he not allowed to have been attend until 12 years old. <laughs> Followed action with great interest and without comment. When cushions commenced to be thrown at cowardly matador, whispered, can I throw mine, Papa? Thought blood on horse's right front leg was paint and asked if horses were so painted so bull could charge them was greatly impressed by bulls, but thought work matadors did looked easy. Admired vulgar bravery of Saturio Torone. Said Torone was his favorite. The others were all frightened, held firm belief that no bullfighter, no matter what he did, was doing his best. <laughs> Took dislike for Viarta, said, I hate Viarta. First time he ever employed this word in regard to a human being. Asked why, answered, I hate the way he looks and the way he acts. <laughs> Declared he did not believe there were any fighters as good as his friend Sidney and that he did not want to see any more fights unless Sidney was going to fight. <laughs> Said he did not like to see the horses injured but laughed at the time and afterwards at only funny incidents in regard to horses. On discovering matadors were killed, decided he would rather be a guide in Wyoming or a trapper. <laughs> Maybe a guide in the summer and a trapper in the winter. Now, there are a lot of these little uh, clinical notes, and I must say I haven't been able to identify them all, being four years old at the time, but there is one that I recognize. This is Captain D.S., and this was a very dear friend of my father's, uh, whom he used partially in Across the River in the Trees for his portrait of a, of a uh, military officer. 26 years old, soldier, British, of Irish and English e extraction, education, public schools, and Sandhurst. Went out to Mons in 1914 as infantry officer, wounded August 27th, 1914. 1914, 18, brilliant record as infantry officer. Rides to hounds and in regimental point-to-points. Recreations, hunting, skiing, mountaineering. Is widely read and is an intelligent appreciation of modern writing and painting. Does not care for gaming or betting. Suffered sincerely and deeply at what happened to the horses at first bullfight. Said it was the most hateful thing he had ever seen. Continued to attend them, he said, in order to understand the mentality of people who would tolerate such a thing. At the end of his sixth fight, understood them so well that he became embroiled in a dispute through defending the conduct of a matador, Juan Año Nacional Secundo, during the fight when a spectator insulted him. Went in the ring in the amateur fights in the morning, wrote two articles on bullfighting, one of them an apology for it in the Regimental Gazette. Now, the last one is really, I think, the whole point of this reading, because I understand there's been a very nice meeting here about the difference between art and reality and how art makes something out of reality that is infinitely superior to the reality that inspired it. This is a portrait of the real uh, Lady Brett Ashley, which I'm sure if you're a lover of Hemingway, you have read all about And the Sun Also Rises. 30 years old, English, private school and convent education, ridden horses, alcoholic nymphomaniac. <laughs> Done some painting. Spent money much too fast to be able to gamble with it. Gambled occasionally with borrowed money. Love drinking more than excitement. Rather shocked by horses, but so excited by bullfighters and generally strong emotion 
that she became a partisan of the spectacle, drunk herself out of any remembrance of it shortly after. <laughs> so that's not the Bre Brett Ashley you read about in The Sun Also Rises. <laughs> so he did make something out of her, right? <laughs> Uh, so now it's my privilege uh, to introduce Edith Perlman. She was one of the judges for the Penn Hemingway Award this year, and she's award-winning uh, writer herself for her collection of short stories, Binocular Vision. So, Edith Perlman. It's a pleasure to be here today to announce um, the, the, the finalists and the winner of the Hemingway Award. Andre Dubus, Sig Sigrid Nunez, and I were the judges for the Penn Hemingway Award, and we were very impressed with the excellence of the writing we read and with the, writing, with the writer's willingness to be adventurous in form and style. There are two finalists for this award, one is novelist Amy Waldman, author of The Submission, published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. The citation reads, the submission is a bold and ambitious work of imagination that would have been remarkable had it come from a novelist of much greater experience. It goes to the heart of one of society's most difficult questions, what do the living owe the dead? Amy Waldman has written a superbly suspenseful story that deepens our understanding of the nature of political and religious belief and the power and meaning of art. Amy. Another splendid finalist is Stephanie Powell Watts, author of the short story collection, We Will Take Only What We Need, published by Bookmark Press. The citation reads, these stories about black people in rural North Carolina stretch their genre. They invite us to observe the workings of institutions as various as Jehovah's Witnesses and the National Kennel Club. Everybody and his dog has a dog. With her elliptical wit, Stephanie Powell Watts offers a new voice, a voice to listen for. Stephanie. The winner of the 2012 Penn Hemingway Award is Teju Cole, author of Open City, published by Random House. After, re after receiving his citation, Teju will read from his remarkable voice. His citation reads, told in a meditative yet utterly entrancing voice, Teju Cole's extraordinary Open City takes us deep into the consciousness of its narrator a young doctor whose daily and nightly wanderings through Manhattan are a descent not only into his own boyhood memories of Nigeria, but also into our collective human past with all its blood and beauty and tangled yearning for what is so often just out of reach. This is a profoundly satisfying debut by a novelist who writes as if he's been doing it for decades. Teju.
thank you. Um, it's a bit of a, uh, it's like a Nigerian email scam. <laughs> Gone terribly right. Um, and I, I still have my suspicions since this is uh, April Fool's Day. Uh, the clowns are going to leap out at any moment. And thank you so much. Um, I just want to say a, a few words of thanks and then I'll read from my book. Uh, in 1995, as a 19-year-old in, uh, oh, thereabouts, yeah, in uh, Boston for a few months doing an internship, I lived with a family in Beverly, Massachusetts, and I had a bit of a commute into the city. Um, and in the course of that commute, I used to grab small books out of their bookshelves and uh, read them on my way. And in that period of time, um, I read uh, the Catcher in the Rye, a portrait of an artist as a young man, and The Old Man and the Sea. And I, I basically date my uh, literary formation back to those days. It was the first time I realized that a book was something that was put together with, uh, with attention and strategy and care. So um, it feels just right to be in Boston and to be honored by the Hemingway Foundation. I'd like to thank uh, my wife, Karen, who is in the audience my parents, my siblings, my friends, all the people who made this work possible, my editor David at Random House and uh, my agent Scott, um, and also the judges who uh, selected uh, m myself and my fellow nominees out of uh, a tremendous mass of books. Um, to have been ch uh, chosen as a winner feels like a tremendous stroke of good luck. Um, to have been chosen as a nominee feels like a recognition of merit. Um, and I'm terribly honored to have been chosen as a nominee for this prize. And I feel very, very lucky to, to have emerged as the winner. Um, thanks also to uh, Patrick Hemingway uh, for saying he really likes my book. <laughs> because I've heard from other people that he doesn't bullshit. Um, and thanks for all the organizers of the prize and all the various uh, organizations um, involved. Uh, I, the way I sort of feel about prizes in general is, is that they are a kind of uh, world building, a culture building kind of activity, um, a way of including voices into the conversation. Um, I'm, a, I'm an American citizen who happens to have one foot also in Nigeria. and. Um, Winning a prize like this, uh, the first time I have won a prize since I was in high school, um, I was an indifferent college student, um, feels like I have been welcomed here and my voice has been included in our ongoing conversation. Thank you very much. I'd just like to read you a little bit from my novel, Open City. Open City is narrated by a Nigerian-German psychiatrist uh, named Julius, who um, some years after 9-11 is untangling uh, some parts of, of himself, his psyche, and, and this, a city uh, after disaster, a city in mourning. Uh, much of the book is taken up with his solitary wanderings um, or his one-on-one -on -one conversations with strangers or acquaintances. Uh, but there's a little piece in the middle of the book where it's not raining or foggy, uh, he's not quite so morose, and he's actually in the company of friends. And since I'm in the company of, company of friends here today, I would like to read that part for you. In the spring, life came back into the Earth's body. I went to a picnic in Central Park with friends, and we sat under magnolias that had already lost their white flowers. Nearby were the cherry trees, which, leaning across the wire fence behind us, were aflame with pink blossom. Nature is infinitely patient. One thing lives after another has given way. The magnolia's blooms die just as the cherries come to life. The sun coming through the petals of the cherry blossoms dapple the damp grass, and new leaves in their thousands 
danced in the April breeze, so that at moments the trees at the far border of the lawn seemed insubstantial. I lay half in shadow, watching a black pigeon walk toward me. It stopped, then flew up and out of sight behind the trees, then came back again, walking awkwardly as pigeons do, perhaps seeking crumbs. And far above the bird and me was the sudden apparition of three circles, three white circles against the sky. In recent years, I have noticed how much the light affects my ability to be sociable. In winter, I retreat. In the long and sunny days following, in March, April, and May, I am much more likely to seek out the company of others, more likely to feel myself alert to sights and sounds, to colors, patterns, moving bodies, smells other than the ones in my office or at the apartment. The cold months make me feel dull, and spring feels like a gentle sharpening of the senses. In our little group in the park that day, we were four, all reclining on a large striped blanket, eating pita bread and hummus, picking at green grapes. It was a warm day, but not so warm that the great lawn was packed. We were part of a crowd of city dwellers in a carefully orchestrated fantasy of country life. Moji had brought Anna Karenina with her, and she leaned on her elbow and read from the thick volume. It was one of the new translations, only occasionally interrupting herself to participate in the conversation. And a few yards away from us was a young father calling out to his toddler who was wandering away, Anna, Anna. There had been a plane traveling at such a height above us that the grumble of its jets was barely audible of our discussion. Then only its faint contrail remained, and just as that faded, we saw the three white circles growing. The circles floated up, appearing to fall upward at the same time that they were falling down. Then everything resolved like a camera viewfinder coming into focus, and we saw the human shape within each circle. Each person, each of these flying men, steered his parachute to the left and to the right, and watching them, I felt the blood race inside my veins. Everyone on the lawn was by now alert. Ball games stopped, chatter became loud, and many arms pointed upward. The toddler, Anna, astonished as we all were, held onto her father's leg. The parachutists were expert, floating towards each other until they were in a kind of shuttlecock formation, then drifting apart again and staring towards the center of the lawn. They came closer to earth, falling faster. I imagined the whoosh around their ears as it cut through the air, imagined the tight focus with which they were bracing themselves for landing. When they were at a height of some 500 feet, I saw that they were dressed in white jumpsuits with white straps. The silken parachutes were like the enormous white wings of alien butterflies. For a moment, all surrounding sound seemed to fall away. The spectacle of men fulfilling the ancient dream of flight unfolded in silence. I could almost imagine what it was like for them, surrounded by clear blue spaces, even though I've never skydived. Once, on a similarly fine day, a quarter of a century ago, I had heard a boy's cries. We were in the water, more than a dozen of us, and he drifted away towards a deep end. He couldn't swim. We were in a large swimming pool on the campus of the University of Lagos. As a child, I had become a strong swimmer at my mother's insistence and somewhat to my father's dismay, since he was himself afraid of water. She had taken me to lessons at the country club from the time I was five or six, and a good swimmer herself, she had watched without fear as I had learned to be at home in the water. From her, I had learned that fearlessness. I haven't been in a pool in years, but once my ability had made a difference. It was the year before I went away to boarding school. I had saved another's life. This boy, of whom I re now remember nothing other than the fact that he was, like me, of mixed race, in his case half Indian, was in mortal danger, drawn into increasingly deeper areas of the pool the more he struggled to keep his head above water. The other children, shocked into inaction by his distress, had remained in the shallow end watching. There was no lifeguard present, 
and none of the adults, assuming any of them was a swimmer, was close enough to the deep end of the pool to help. I don't remember deliberating or considering any danger to myself, only that I set off in his direction as fast as I could. The moment that has stayed in my mind is of having not yet reached the boy, but having already left the crowd of children behind. Between his cries and theirs, I swam hard. But caught in the blue expanse around me and above, I suddenly felt like I was no closer to him than I had been a few moments before, as though water intervened intentionally between where he was in the shadow of the diving structures and where I floated in the bright sunshine. I had stopped swimming, and the air cooled the water on my face. The boy flailed, briefly breaking the surface with frantic arms before he was pulled under again. The strong shadows made it difficult for me to see what was happening. I thought for an instant that I would always be swimming towards him, that I would never cross the remaining distance of 12 or 15 yards. But the moment was to pass, and I would become the hero of the day. There was laughter afterward, and the half-Indian boy was teased. But it might easily have been a tragic afternoon. What I hauled, the short distance, the diving platform, might have been a small, lifeless body. But almost all that day's detail was soon lost to me, and what remained most strongly was the sensation of being all alone in the water, that feeling of genuine isolation, as though I had been cast without preparation into some immense and not unpleasant blue chamber far from humanity. For the parachutists, the distance between heaven and earth began to vanish more quickly and the ground suddenly rushed upward to meet them. Sound returned and they landed one after another neatly in billowing clouds to the whistles and whoops of the picnickers in the park. I applauded too. The parachutists slipped out from under their tents, crouching and signaled to each other. Then they rose like victorious matadors gesturing to the crowd, and were rewarded with our cries and louder applause. Then it stopped. Above the noise, we heard the blaze of sirens on the east side of the park. Four police officers came racing over the ropes around the perimeter of the lawn and ran towards its center, all as ungainly in their movement as the parachutists had been balletic. We began to boo, safe in our numbers, and were pushed back from the congratulations congratulatory circle we had formed so they could arrest the daredevils. Someone at the far end of the circle shouted, security theater, but the wind had picked up and it swallowed her voice. They did not resist arrest. No longer encumbered by their wings, they were led away by the police. The crowd began to cheer again, and the parachutists, all young men, grinned and bowed, one of them taller than the other two, had a full ginger beard that glinted in the sun. The parachutes remained in a glossy heap in the grass, and when the wind picked up again, seemed to give off trembling exhalations. And so we watched the parachutes breathe for a while as the men were led away. Then, but only after what seemed like a long time out of ordinary time, we came out of the marvelous and resumed our picnic. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my honor and pleasure as the current chair of Penn New England to present this year's Lawrence L. and Thomas Winship Penn New England Awards. These prestigious awards were named for the much beloved and respected editors of the Boston Globe, Lawrence L. Winship and Thomas Winship. This is a great day in New England for many of us. The real arrival of spring is marked by this gathering of writers, publishers, editors, agents, students, 
by this gathering of a community of readers to honor the solitary, exacting, and important work that writers do to illuminate our lives. Before we present the awards, I'd like to thank our judges this year, Mimi Schwartz in nonfiction, Crystal Wilkinson in fiction, and Jean Marie Beaumont in poetry. And now it gives me great pleasure to announce the winner of the Lawrence L. Winship and Thomas Winship Penn New England Award in nonfiction, Mitchell Zukoff, for Lost in Shangri-La. In her citation, Judge Mimi Schwartz writes, in Mitchell Zukoff's true story, Lost in Shangri-La, exciting storytelling and careful research come together seamlessly. We are transported back to 1945 in Dutch New Guinea, where a plane with 24 US servicemen and WACs crash in a, crashes in a remote jungle. Three survive, two men and a woman. Using many sources, including photos, letters, reports, interviews, and on-site investigation, Zukov rec recreates far more than just what happened. He explores a larger canvas of what it takes to survive, of what it was like to be a woman in the US military during World War II, of the first clash of cultures between native tribesmen and white Westerners, all is told with clarity, suspense, and an allegiance to fact that shows us narrative nonfiction at its best. Mitchell Zukov. And the Lawrence L. Winship and Thomas Winship Penn New England Award in Poetry goes to Elizabeth Willis for her collection, Address. In her citation, Judge Jean Marie Beaumont writes, Address, a modest, a modest word with great command, suits Elizabeth Willis's work perfectly. It entitles the speaker of these poems to invite, pronounce, direct, catalog, intimate, locate, provoke, legislate, intuit, and affirm, sometimes several of these at the same time. Magically brought into being by the wiles of Willis, the poems combined bewitching ingenuity with a lean abundance. As such, they seem pure products of New England soil while addressing our ongoing national predicaments. Address is mischievous enough to be pleasurable, dangerous enough to keep you alert, and just strange enough to provide the good company you didn't know you were missing until it arrived to greet you. Elizabeth Willis. In fiction, the Lawrence L. Winship and Thomas Winship Penn New England Award is given to Yannick Murphy for her novel, The Call. Crystal Wilkinson, this year's fiction judge, describes the book. Every reader yearns to read something they've never encountered, a great story that feels at once familiar, original, vibrant, and seductive. And every writer wants to write such a story. Yannick Murphy's The Call is such a book. Murphy brilliantly uses a veterinarian's log to explore the lives of a family in rural New England as they deal with first an accident and then the unraveling of a father's secret. Murphy gives us this family's expansive truths with an unflinching eye, with startling honesty, humor, and always with beauty. This small gem is full of well-rounded characters, is written in a style so unique that you might think, bah, this'll never work. But ah, 
Yes, it does, and does so fiercely. It arcs and waves and swirls with pluck and heart, and is at once rivetingly simple and complex. What talent, what generosity Murphy has. The vet, his wife, their children, the animals, the animal's owners, the spaceship, the spaceman, <laughs> The house, the landscape, the dinners are all quite stunning under Murphy's hands. And now Ms. Murphy will also read for us from the call. Yannick Murphy. I have a confession to make. My confession is that when Karen Wolf called my house to tell me that I had won the award, I wasn't there, and my husband and my son were there, and um, they told me beforehand. And the reason they told me beforehand was because um, I came home, I was in a really bitchy mood, <laughs> and, and it, I wasn't letting up. And so my husband said to my son, well, should we tell her? And my son said, I don't know, should we tell her? Maybe it'll make her feel better. And I was very impatient at the moment. I said, what do you mean? And what are you going to tell me? And they said, well, you've won this award. I was like, oh, right. And they said, yes, really, April 1st, you're supposed to be there at the awards. <laughs> I was like, oh, right, this is the greatest April Fool's joke. So Karen, I apologize. When you called and said, and you've won, and I hope your husband didn't tell you. And I said, no, no, he didn't tell me. <laughs> because I know how much fun it is to call someone and tell them the great news. And that great news is still with me and it didn't diminish my excitement. So here's just a, a little bit from the call. Call, a cow with her dead calf, half born. Action, put on boots and pulled dead calf out while standing in a field full of mud Result, hind legs tore off from dead calf while I pulled. Head, forelegs, and torso are still inside the mother. Thoughts on drive home while passing red and gold leaves on maple trees. Is there a nicer place to live? What children said to me when I got home. Hi, Pop. What the wife cooked for dinner. Something mixed up. Call. Old woman with minis needs butte paste. Action, drove to old woman's house, delivered butte paste, pet minis, learned their names, Molly, Nettie, Sunny, and Storm. Result, minis are really cute. Thoughts on drive home, must bring children back here sometime to see the cute minis. What children said to me when I got home, Hi, Pop. What the wife cooked for dinner. Steak and potatoes, no salad. She said, David, our salad days are over. <laughs> it now being autumn and the garden bare except for wind-tossed fallen leaves. Call, six sheep. Action, visited sheep. Noticed they'd eaten all the thistle. Result, talk to owner, who is a composer about classical music, admired his tall barn beams, advised owner to fence off thistle so sheep couldn't eat it. Sheep become sick from thistle. Thoughts on drive home. Is time travel possible? Maybe time is not a thing because light takes a while to travel. What we're seeing is always in the past. What the wife cooked for dinner, breakfast, Call, castrate draft horse. Action, pulled out emasculators, castrated draft horse. Result, draft horse bled buckets. Pooled around his hooves. Owner said she had never seen so much blood. It's okay, he's got a lot of blood, I said. She nodded. She braided the fringe on her poncho, watching the blood. Thoughts on drive home. What's the point of a poncho if it doesn't cover your arms? What the wife cooked for dinner, nut loaf. What I ate for dinner, not nut loaf.
call, horses colicking, action, drove to farm, dodging dry, brown leaves skating across the road, because at first I thought they were mice or voles running to the safety of the other side, gave horse banamine, watched him sweating, watched him rolling on his stall floor, watched owner cry, just a few tears down a freckled cheek, listened to horses in other stalls whinny, worried for the colicky horse. Result, stayed for hours until night. Moon was full, walked horse out to field by the apple tree, gave him a shot to put him to sleep, patted his neck, left owner with her head by his head, not saying anything, maybe just breathing in his last exhaled breath. Thoughts on drive home. When I go, I want to go in a field by an apple tree on a full moon night. What I saw when I pulled up to the house, bright lights in the sky, an object moving quickly back and forth, not a plane. What I heard from children when I got home, gentle snoring. What I heard from my wife when I got home, loud snoring. Call, no call. Action, stayed at home. Result, wished the children were home with me. Resented school for taking them away and teaching them nothing. They would learn more at home with me. I would teach them things I want to learn. Violin, German, the possibility of time travel. Thoughts while walking through the woods looking for spots to raise deer stand. When shooting the rifle, make sure the deer is moving. Otherwise, he will notice the safety releasing. He will bolt before you squeeze off the shot. Will I even see a buck this year? What the children said to me when I got home. Pop, there was a moose in the back of the house. What the wife said, a cow, not a bull. What I said, everybody, let's go for a walk and see if we can see her again. What we came across, moose poop, bear poop, deer poop, coyote poop, fallen over rotting mushrooms that looked like loose poop. What I pointed out to my son, the barks of trees rubbed off by the antlers of deer, flattened ferns where deer had lain. What Sam said, I can't wait to hunt. The deer are all around us. What we did, put our hands down on the flattened ferns to see if they were still warm and then we walked back home, avoiding breaking spanning cobwebs in our way. What the wife cooked for dinner, spaghetti with meat sauce, black olives, and mushrooms. What Mia, my youngest, my six-year-old, said to me before bedtime, Poppy, I'm going to cold you up. Then she reached her cold hands up under my shirt and touched my back. What Sam, my oldest, my 12-year-old, showed me before bedtime, how to exhale when squeezing off a shot to avoid excessive movement and achieve the truest aim. What Sarah, the middle child, my 10-year-old, said to me, Lyle got detention for throwing a pencil at Miss Ackerman when she turned her back. What the owls said at night, we are in every tree in a five-mile radius. What the wife said in bed while the light of the full moon came in through the window. Somebody turn off that light. Thank you. I am Marianne Leone, and I'm here to introduce Andre Debuse. It was my great good fortune to meet Andre Debuse just before my first book was to be published. We found ourselves packed into a bar after a Grub Street event, shouting our life stories to each other. I told him I was a first-generation Italian-American. Andre almost leaped out of the booth, telling me he loved the meds. Mediterraneans. He is married to the luscious Greek-American Fontaine. 
And that med love gave me the temerity to send him an advance copy of my first ever attempt at long form prose. I say temerity because at the time I only knew that Andre wrote House of Sand and Fog. If I had known the long list of his other achievements, I would have been too gobsmacked to give him my book. Andre is also the author of The Cage Keeper and Other Stories, Blues Man, and the New York Times bestseller, House of Sand and Fog, and The Garden of Last Days. His memoir, Townie, was also a New York Times bestseller and a New York Times editor's choice, and was named on many top nonfiction books of 2011 lists, including the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, The Library Journal, Kirkus Reviews, and Esquire Magazine. His work has been included in the Best American Essays of 1994 and the Best Spiritual Writing of 1999. He has been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, the National Magazine Award for Fiction, the Push Pushcart Prize, and was a finalist for the National Book Award. He is the recipient of the Rome Prize Fellowship from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and is a 2012 recipient of an Arts and Letters Award in Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Andre has been a leader and long-standing member of Penn New England. Impressive, right? But Andre's official bio left off the most important prize, the one I made up. So today, I'm awarding Andre the Generosity of Spirit Prize from all the unnamed writers he's mentored and encouraged, myself included. This prize is given for the fire in his soul, his curiosity about what a piece of work is man and woman, his passion for truth, and for using that generosity of spirit to mentor and guide and encourage those who want to write. In my own experience, this is the man who handed me a quote praising my book that brought tears to my eyes. This is the man who at his first reading for Townie pointed me out in the audience and praised my own memoir so that it sold every copy in the bookstore that night. And this is the generous soul who, when I started my first novel, screwed my courage to the sticking point when I was deafened by the disembodied MFA rule keepers around me yelling, omniscient voice, third person, you can't do that in a novel. Andre gave me his best piece of advice then, which I now pass on to you. There are no bleeping rules, just write. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my friend and mentor, Andre Debuse. I do love the meds. Mary Ann, thank you, honey. That was just so sweet and generous. She's very generous. Uh, look, I'm so happy today because you know what? Literature is, in fe is feeling increasingly marginalized to me in the 21st century, but it ain't today. Let's just, and it's not. Uh, and, and also, a, another round of applause, if you don't mind, for the, for the fine writers whose stellar work we're honoring today. All right, so um, if I were to title my talk today, it would be this. Ernest Hemingway, Why His Work Matters Now More Than Ever, A Love Letter from the Digital World. Most writers, I believe, are not aware of or else do not give a lot of thought to literary movements in which they may find themselves working. So with this caveat, I present to you a brief and shamelessly reductive history of literary movements of the last 150 years. In their rejection of the age of enlightenment and all of its scientific rationalizations came the joyfully irrational romantics and a celebration of intuition, imagination, and individual genius. There came the optimistic presence of the all-knowing narrator and a worshiping awe in the face of untamed nature. 
This gave us some greats like Lord Byron, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Mary Shelley, John Keats, James Finnemore Cooper, Edgar Allan Poe, and Herman Melville, to name just a few. Then in June 1914, a bullet tore through Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, and the war to end all wars began its horrific march forward. Four years later, nine million combatants would lie dead, and the modernists were already busy composing, painting, and writing, trying to restore meaning to a shell-shocked, fragmented, and alienated people, a lost generation, as Gertrude Stein called them. Where the romantics were optimistic, the modernists were pessimistic. They no longer trusted powerful institutions like government and religion, and there was a rejection of the notion of absolute truths. Instead, there was a turning inward, a central focus on the inner self and consciousness, and what was often found was darkness. In literature, something brand new appeared. In place of the trustworthy, all-knowing narrator of the Victorians, there came the unreliable narrator. James Joyce's Ulysses, with its stream of consciousness attempting to capture consciousness itself. Proust's remembrance of things past, Kafka's metamorphosis, D.H. Lawrence's sons and lovers, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, and the stoic, ironic, unforgettable protagonist of Ernest Hemingway's first novel, The Sun Also Rises. Jake Barnes is a young man whose war wound prevents him from making love with a woman ever again, but he is in love with Brett Ashley, one of the most attractive women in Paris. The following two pages begins chapter four. The taxi went up the hill, past the lighted square, then on into the dark, still climbing, then leveled out onto a dark street behind Saint-Anne-du-Mont, went smoothly down the asphalt, past the trees and the standing bus at the Place de la Contrescarpe, then turned onto the cobbles of the Rue Mouffetal. There were lighted bars and late open shops on each side of the street. We were sitting apart and we jolted close together going down the old street. Brett's hat was off, her head was back. I saw her face in the lights from the open shops, then it was dark, then I saw her face clearly as we came out on the Avenue des Gobelins. The street was torn up and the men were working on the car tracks by the light of acetylene flares. Brett's face was white and the long line of her neck showed in the bright light of the flares. The street was dark again, and I kissed her. Our lips were tight together, and then she turned away and pressed against the corner of the seat as far away as she could get. Her head was down. Don't touch me, she said. Please, don't touch me. What's the matter? I can't stand it. Oh, Brett. You mustn't. You must know. I can't stand it. That's all. Oh, darling, please understand. Don't you love me? Love you? I simply turn to jelly when you touch me. Isn't there anything we can do about it? She was sitting up now. My arm was around her, and she was leaning back against me, and we were quite calm. She was looking into my eyes with that way she had of looking that made you wonder whether she really saw out of her own eyes. They would look on and on after everyone else's in the world would have stopped looking. She looked as though there was nothing on earth she would not look at like that, and really, she was afraid of so many things. And there's not a damn thing we could do, I said. I don't know, she said. I don't want to go through that hell again. We better keep away from each other. But darling, I have to see you. It isn't all that, you know. No, but it always gets to be. That's my fault. Don't we pay for all the things we do, though? She had been looking into my eyes all the time. Her eyes had different depths. Sometimes they seemed perfectly flat. Now you could see all the way into them. When I think of the hell I've put chaps through, I'm paying for it all now. Don't talk like a fool, I said. Besides, what happened to me is supposed to be funny. I never think about it. Oh, no, I'll lay you don't. Well, let's shut up about it. I laughed about it, too, myself once. She wasn't looking at me. A friend of my brother came home that way from Mont. It seemed like a hell of a joke. Chaps never know anything, do they? I was pretty well through with the subject. 
At one time or another, I had probably considered it from its various angles, including the one that certain injuries or imperfections are a subject of merriment while remaining quite serious for the person possessing them. It's funny, I said, it's very funny, and it's a lot of fun too to be in love. I first read this passage in this masterful novel nearly 35 years ago. I was 18 and knew nothing of war or wounds of Jake's gravity. But in the mill town in which I was raised, I knew something about physical violence and depression and loss. It was also the 1970s, and our country was, it was in its own gray post-war years. At the time, I was, in love with, I was in love with and dating a Shiite Muslim girl from Iran, so I knew something of forced abstinence, too. That's an essay I'll never write. And what I knew most of all is that Ernest Hemingway, <clears throat> excuse me, with a novel written decades before my birth, had somehow given significant portions of my own life back to me. This is ultimately an act of great artistic responsibility, and I will return to it in a bit. What I did not know then was just how pioneering and original a writer Ernest Hemingway was that he was one of the very first, if not the first, working so diligently to give the reader the full experience of his characters. Gone were the ornamental adjectives of the Victorian novelist. Gone, too, was their godlike presence. Instead, through the use of the first person or third person subjective point of view, we experienced the world solely through the hearts and minds of Hemingway's characters. In Jake Barnes's case above, Hemingway, through precise use of essential sensory detail, puts us in that taxi as Jake, sitting beside the woman he loves and who loves him, both of them stricken with the knowledge that they will never consummate that love sexually. Except Hemingway only takes us so far. While Jake tells Brett that what's happened to him is supposed to be funny, we also know that he thinks, quote, Certain imperfections or injuries are a subject of merriment while they remain quite serious for the person possessing them, unquote. This is dramatic irony. We see that there is far more to his injury and his relationship to it than Jake is letting on, but by leaving it there, Hemingway is trusting the reader to do the rest of the work, to bring his or her own lives to the novel. Not only is this a respectful act, but it is also one that achieves Leo Tolstoy's definition of art. Quote, art is transferring feeling from one heart to another. In byline, Hemingway's posthumously published collected articles and dispatches over four decades, he writes, when you start to write, you get all the kick and the reader gets none. After you learn to write, your whole object is to convey everything, every sensation, sight, feeling, place, and emotion to the reader. To do this, you have to work over what you write. In Death in the Afternoon, he goes further in explaining his artistic process. For myself, the problem was one of depiction. And waking in the night, I tried to remember what it was that seemed just out of my remembering, and that was the thing that I had really seen, and finally, remembering all around it, I got it. When he, the matador, stood up, his face white and dirty, and the silk of his breeches opened from waist to knee, it was the dirtiness of the rented breeches, the dirtiness of his slit underwear, and the clean, clean, unbearably clean whiteness of the thigh bone that I had seen, and it was that which was important. In a 1925 letter to his father, Hemingway writes, you see, I'm trying in all my stories to get the feeling of the actual life across, not just to depict life or criticize it, but to actually make it alive so that when you read something by me, you actually experience the thing. I submit to you that Ernest Hemingway's sustained discipline to find and then, con and then convey those details, which will then give the experience fully to the reader, is one of the more generous and responsible creative acts in the history of American literature. But now, a brief digression back to literary movements of the last 150 years. 
From the modernists, and I don't think, by the way, creative writers think about this a hell of a lot. But scholars do, and they should. From the modernists of the early 20th century came the postmodernists. Some argue this period began with the deaths of James Joyce and Virginia Woolf in 1941. Others maintain that postmodernism began in the years after World War II and was a reaction to the Cold War and postcolonialism and the invention of the personal computer. While the modernists sought to restore some sense of meaning to our fragmented selves in the wasteland, T.S. Eliot writes, these fragments I have shored against my ruins. For the postmodernists, there is no shoring up. Ruin is inevitable, meaning is elusive, chaos reigns, and the artist is largely impotent. Gone is the willing suspension of disbelief. What comes instead is metafiction, writers writing about writing, the goal being to make the artificiality of the art of fiction apparent to the reader. Author is character, self-contradicting plots, historical falsehoods, playing with form and language, the blurring of reality in fiction. In fact, the very existence of reality itself is called into question. And so there is no longer the desire to achieve order and meaning. An authorial playfulness and ironic self-awareness rule. Writers working largely in this way include Samuel Beckett, William S. Burroughs, Thomas Pynchon, John Barth, William Gaddis, Kurt Vonnegut, and more recently David Foster Wallace, Zadie Smith, Jonathan Lethem, and Lydia Davis, to name only a few. The late cultural theorist Jean Baudrillard said that postmodernism is defined by a shift into hyper-reality in which simulations have replaced the real. It is also marked by stark irony and black humor, which are powerful tools in the right hands. Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five comes to mind, Don DeLillo's White Noise, and Tim O'Brien's In the Lake of the Woods. But for me, while I applaud the experimental nerve displayed here, so much of this work falls horribly short. Why? All of this authorial play seems to have forgotten the reader entirely. Without naming any particular book or writer, there is often the sense that all these printed words, so many words, too many words, and very few of them trying, it seems, to capture or to convey anything, are there simply to show off the writer and his or her erudition or hipness or detached world wariness or numbness, writing as self-advertisement, writing as a public act of self-indulgence, in his controversial A Reader's Manifesto, B.R. Myers calls much of postmodern writing disorganized language play for its own sake, empty of any emotional commitment. Contrast this with these words from Ernest Hemingway from Death in the Afternoon. When writing a novel, a writer should create living people, people, not characters. A character is a caricature. If a writer can make people live, there may be no great characters in his book, but it is possible that his book will remain as a whole, as an entity, as a novel. If the people the writer is making talk of old masters, of music, of modern painting, of letters, or of science, then they should talk of those subjects in the novel. If they do not talk of those subjects, and the writer makes them talk of them, he is a faker. And if, he had talked, and if he talks about them himself to show how much he knows, then he is showing off. No matter how good a phrase or a simile he may have, if he puts it in where it is not absolutely necessary and irreplaceable, he is spoiling the work for egotism. So where are we now? Well, as the industrial age has given way to the information age and all of its techno cyber gadgets, Many argue we are now living in post-post-modern times. What writer Alan Kirby calls, and I love this, digimodernism, or pseudo-modernism. He explains it this way, quote, the culture we have now fetishizes the recipient of the text to the, deg to the degree that they become a partial or whole author of it. Pseudo-modernism makes the individual's action the necessary condition of the cultural product. What the hell is he talking about? 
American Idol. Our phoned in votes on American Idol choose who wins. There are the video games where the viewer chooses the various outcomes. There are ebooks which do the same thing. There is hypertext, cybertext, the random sampling of individual chapters, on and on. If the postmodernist called, called into question the existence of reality, Kirby argues, that in the pseudo modern, digi modern world, reality is me. Let me repeat that because I think it's ingenious. <laughs> it's Alan Kirby, not me. Reality is me. Quote, here, the typical emotional state radically superseding the hyperconsciousness of irony is the trance, the state of being swallowed up by your activity in place of the neurosis of modernism and the narcissism of postmodernism, pseudo-modernism pseudo takes the world away by creating a new weightless nowhere. You click, you punch the keys, you are quote unquote involved, engulfed, deciding. You are the text, there is no one else, no author, there is nowhere else, no other time and place, you are free. You are the text. The text is superseded." Unquote. Except, as he articulates so well here, you are not involved. You are under the influence of nothingness. As a teacher of people born in the 1990s, I see the effects of this techno-induced trance all the time, and I know you do too. There's a distracted glaze in the eye, as if something very important is happening somewhere else, and he or she is missing it. <laughs> and what are they missing? A text from a friend telling them they just bought a mochaccino? <laughs> a tweet from a rapper hooking up with another rapper? And there's this world weariness in the eyes that comes not from the world itself, but from multiple cyber simulations of the world. I often feel I've shown up to a party late and everyone is stoned. <laughs> if you agree with me that all of this may be problematic, I humbly suggest an antidote. Art, true art, the kind of art that Ernest Hemingway created, created decades ago and which rightly still lives so vibrantly between the pages of his books. Not long ago, I read his 1926 short story, Hills Like White Elephants, to 43 undergraduates. All their gadgets were off, and after only a page or so, I could see and feel them listening to this man and woman talking at an outdoor table at the train station, waiting for the express to Barcelona. The warm wind blew the bead against the curtain. The beer is nice and cool, the man said. It's lovely, the girl said. It's really an awfully simple operation, Jig, the man said. It's really not an operation at all. The girl looked at the ground the table legs rested on. I know you wouldn't mind it, Jig. It's really not anything. It's just to let the air in. The girl did not say anything. I'll go with you and I'll stay with you all the time. They just, they just let the air in and it's all perfectly natural. Then what will we do afterward? We'll be fine afterward, just like we were before. What makes you think so? That's the only thing that bothers us. It's the only thing that's made us unhappy. The girl looked at the bead curtain, put her hand out, and took hold of two of the strings of beads. And you think then we'll be all right and happy? I know we will. You don't have to be afraid. I've known lots of people that have done it. So have I, said the girl. And afterward, they were all so happy. The story continues, of course, and things get no better for this young woman who clearly wants to have this baby while her older lover clearly does not. I finished reading and looked up at my 43 students. All of them were looking back at me, some of them, the young women especially, visibly moved. At the start of class, when many of them were turning off their various devices and stuffing them into backpacks like crack pipes to which they would soon return, they still had that techno-distracted glaze to the eye, the remnant of that trance Alan Kirby writes about. 
But now, the last line of Hemingway's masterpiece echoing in their heads, I saw an entirely different light in their eyes, the light of engagement with their world, which begins always, it seems, with an engagement with our very selves. After class, one of the young women lingered. On her bare sternum was the fresh tattoo of a blackbird, one of her ears heavily pierced while the other was not. Her eyes began to fill, and I asked her if she was all right. She nodded. You sure? She nodded again. That was just so real. A and that's good? She wiped at both eyes, turned to leave, and said, I just, I really needed that. I'll close now with two unoriginal notions about Ernest Hemingway. First, the Hemingway hero is a macho's man's man full of bravado. This is a shallow reading of his work. Most of his characters, like Jane Barnes, Jake Barnes in The Sun Also Rises, and like the narrator of his lapidary short story in Another Country, are wounded, psychologically fragile, and deeply aware of death. But they're trying to discover how to live anyway, which is a kind of heroism, but without the swagger. Second, and perhaps most importantly, that the myth of Ernest Hemingway, the war correspondent and lion hunter, the two-fisted drinker and fisherman of Marlin, has overshadowed his true legacy. While it's accurate to say he could be deeply competitive with other writers, it's also true, I believe, that his ego was strong enough, unlike so many writers who have followed him into the postmodern and post-postmodern ages, to surrender it entirely to the act of making art, not so much for himself, but for the reader. In this digital present, where so many human faces are lit with the glow of one screen after another, a time when the notion of individuality and the truly real is beginning to blur. More than ever before, we need the life's work of Ernest Hemingway, a writer who's daily surrendering of himself to his novels and stories and the lives being lived inside them, achieves precisely what he hoped it would, to make it alive, which miraculously still has the enduring power to make us more alive in that precious allotment of time we're all given on this earth. Thank you. Andre, thank you so much for those words. And you know, this ceremony is really um, often about, to me, the changing of seasons, and really, in some ways, the connections between generations. And uh, you know, one beautiful connection there is that, as you all know, Andre's father himself uh, was an acclaimed fiction writer and took some of his inspiration from Ernest Hemingway. And I thought I might close with uh, this lovely passage from Ecclesiastes, which Hemingway chose and used uh, to mine the title of that novel. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth abides forever. The sun also rises, and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arose. So the earth abides, and the sea abides, and literature abides. We thank you all for coming. We hope you'll join us at the reception down in the pavilion, and there'll be a book signing. Books are available in the bookstore. If you'd like to buy our prize winners books and have them signed, they'll be available down in the pavilion. Thank you so much all for coming this afternoon.